Ladies and gentlemen, Yancey Ford. today is that the woman who was my art instructor, the woman who um, first helped me um, turn life into art as a way of making sense of the world and making sense of my experiences here. And before I bring up my creative team, I'd like her to stand. Lou Getty, where are you? I'd like to, um, so many people over so many years have helped bring this film to fruition. Um, I'd like to bring up um, the creative team uh, in no particular order. Alan Jacobson, our director of photography. <laughs> and Andre Janus Bilaskov Jensen. Producer Jocelyn Barnes. Producer Sarah Swanson. And our executive producers, Danny Glover, Susan Rockefeller, and Laura Poitras. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to ask Sonia Childress of Firelight Media Impact to join us um, as well. Tony, I'm sorry. Tony, 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 are you here? You want to come up? Me. Yes, I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. Hi. Hi. We can start with questions. Um, I. Anything you want to say? Right now? You know, at the moment, um, thank you to this group of people. Um, and thank you to so many others in the audience um, who have helped me along the way in this journey. It's really, um, I think, one of the most important things to say is thank you. Um, and the film, for the most part, I think, speaks for itself. Yeah. So, Go let's, go to the, let's go to the audience and see what they're thinking. And, yes, sir. People hear the question, okay. So, so um, that's John, right? Yeah, so, um, so John's question was about the intimacy in the film and if my direct camera interviews were shot um, in the presence of a crew or if I, were, um, if I was by myself. Um, John, I did the best possible job at trying to be absolutely by myself in those moments. Um, I had the entire crew behind a wall of sound blankets and um, Alan can tell you more about how the cameras were positioned, but all I could see um, were two marks uh, on the camera lens. And those marks were, um, you know, the, I was talking to the camera. I could hear the voice of the person from the other side of this wall, but everyone was blocked um, from my view, and that really was the only way for, for me to, to to have these genuine moments because they're so vulnerable. Yeah, and just picking up on that, this is also a really interesting part of your film. And I wondered, at what point in the process did you decide to do that? And how did you prepare for it? 
there was no preparing for it, first of all. Um, I, I went into the interviews blind, like all of the other subjects. I, I wasn't privy to any of the questions. They were prepared in, um, in consultation with the producer, the editor, um, and you know, in terms of where the story was, where we, what we needed from my character. But I never knew, because everyone else had taken the risk of simply saying yes to an interview and not knowing what was going to happen after that. And I felt like it was an obligation for me to do the same. Um, but Alan and I talked a lot about um, the way that um, I should be shot in the film. Maybe you should talk about that. Well, at first you weren't to be shot in the film at all. <laughs> when Yancey came to me first, he said, I'm not in this film, and there will be no close-ups in this film. <laughs> Throughout this journey and this, you know, work on finding space for this um, vulnerability to come out, that's what we hit upon, ultimately. And that bravery and vulnerability is all right there in super close up. <laughs> and it's super close up because my mom, you know, Barbara commands, commands, I mean, you can put her in the middle of the sidewalk and she would command the, the street. Um, and so she's center frame, she's, the, she's in the king's chair, which is also a position of authority that we don't often see African Americans in. Um, she's in her, you know, her full self. Um, but for me, I, I tend to have a lot of, um, easy to misinterpret faces. Um, and so the, the extreme close-up for me was a way of allowing the audience to actually see the, 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 the true expression um, and to, to have a sense of the emotional um, realizations and um, discoveries that were happening for me in the moment. I didn't like it at all. <laughs> we, you, we know, but we're glad you did. <laughs> Yes, way in the back. First of all, it's such a remarkable film on so many levels. It's, it's really just a great, great film. My Thank question you. is, in the, I, I may have the timeline wrong, was there any opportunity in the grand jury for someone to talk about the character of your brother as opposed to your brother, the person who was scaring this, this other guy? No, there wasn't. So the question, the question from the gentleman in the back was about the grand jury and whether there was uh, an opportunity for someone to talk about my brother's character. Um, and the witnesses, my mother um, first and foremost, were explicitly prohibited from talking about his character. Um, and apparently character um, is not uh, admissible. Yes. Extraordinary film. I'm so, so glad to be here to see it and that you got it made. And it, congratulations. I just wonder if you would mention something about the title, which many sure. people may not understand. Could you mention something about the title? About the title. Thank yeah. you, Jill Scheinberg. After many it. congratulations from Jill. Yeah. And, but, but Jill knows about the title. So, Strong Island is slang for Long Island, New York. Um, and it's also very, um, very popular and very, uh, very well known in the hip hop world. Um, because a lot of um, there, a, a lot of hip hop originated in Nassau County um, on Long Island. So you know, Strong Island is a is a is a term referring to Long Island um, that uh, anybody who's from Long Island um, will be familiar with. So yes. said at the documentary film program breakfast that independence for you is solidarity. And I ask the question for you now, I'm not sure if you want to answer it, of how to be in solidarity with you when this film shows a deep threat as well. That a you know, threat was made against you and your family. That I, I wonder if it stands today um, and during the making of the film. And if it does, or even if it doesn't, if you know, how we can be in solidarity with, with you and your family in the film. That's a great question about how to stand in solidarity, and I appreciate it, Brenda. I think there are two things. There's a problem when the district attorney is an office that's filled by election. A district attorney should not 
be a politician. A district attorney should be, like our Supreme Court justices, independent of political forces so that they can investigate crime or um, cover cases without political pressure, without whether it be um, from unions um, or um, from special interests. District attorneys should not be politicians. And in my brother's case, the district attorney was a notoriously corrupt politician. Um, secondly, this is the first time the film is shown in public. Um, and I am hoping to direct whatever um, uh, you know, blowback there is as the film rolls out toward me. Um, and personally, I would love somebody to convince my sister to use a um, password generating program and uh, <laughs> take some other, take some other, no, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of teasing, but um, I, I, right now I'm not worried. Um, but if anything comes up, I will let you know. <laughs> thank you. Everyone says thank you. Beautiful. Uh, I lived in Central Islip for about six months in uh, the 80s. What on earth were you doing there for six months in the 80s? Long story, but what I remember about it is that ubiquitous uh, ice cream truck music during the summer. I, mean, I, I imagine one was blowing up because there was always I've noticed in the credits that that song has an interesting title that I've never heard before. So I've learned something, uh, lots of things from the movie. Can you just tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, my partner happens to be writing a fantastic um, um, hybrid uh, work about blackface and um, um, you know, sort of American songs that have um, sort of racist origins. And the ice cream jingle um, is actually a song that was written in the 1800s called Nigger Love a Watermelon, Ha Ha Ha. Uh, and I felt like it was important to put that in the credits so that um, we would know what we were all listening to. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Back to process, I'm wondering about the 10 year trajectory and how you how you work your writing in sort of pre pre all of this, how that layered into it and when. Um, how how did the the ten year trajectory the, yeah, the, um, the trajectory the evolution of the writing and how it all how it all came in. together. Yeah. So, you know, I had a lot of starts and stops. My brother was murdered when I was an art student, so I I started working on this you know, sort of in the back of my mind with the assistance of Lou a long, long time ago. Um, it wasn't until I both took the Third World Newsreel workshop and had a conversation with someone um, who asked me simply, what are you waiting for, um, that um, I actually started actively making the film. And that was January of, tw of 2006. But I had been keeping a journal for a very long time. Um, and a lot of that writing, um, a lot of the um, things I was reading from an excerpt from my production journal. Um, but I also wrote a lot in Copenhagen. Um, and I'm wondering if any of my collaborators, Venus and Jocelyn and Sina, especially since you guys were sort of standing over me as I um, wrote furiously and furiously and furiously, um, if you want to talk about how the writing um, sort of evolved as the edit evolved, I think that's part of it. Is this one word? Yeah. Uh, I think the answer is the first thing when we when we met that there was two things that came very clear uh, in the editing room. Actually, throughout the very first couple of weeks, was that we we knew pretty much the beginning of the film. That was very amazing because it was uh, Barbara's statement, and we also knew. And I hope that I don't have to say that I had to persuade you, but to use your close-ups. And I think the storytelling of having your mother and you in so different framing also put your, your emotional uh, struggle up front, in, uh, and, and that was important. 
throughout the understanding of the whole process, what you was with your with your brother, a lot of questions came up, and because we could work over that long period of time, a lot of questions came up that needed to be answered, and we had that opportunity to go back and place you in front of the camera, even though that I know that you really didn't want to do it, but I think that you did a very important uh, and significant being on the screen in order to understand it. And throughout that process, we developed the story. And I think that for the very first couple of weeks that we worked is that we actually did have the beginning and we almost also had the ending in the audience to understand that we had the very way of the last statement of your mother. So that we have those two, uh, but not necessarily had the ending of the ending, but having those two, you know, from, I mean, you, you, uh, uh, how can I say, the light, or the lighthouses, to build the story between. Did that answer your question, or? I don't know. I would we can talk a lot about it. Sure, we could, we could. I mean, we could, I think one of the challenging things with the film was to find a way to weave the larger historical context, uh, the, the narrative of this country, um, together with this very intimate story. And um, I think that the invitation that Yancey so generously offers um, for people to enter the family um, creates not so much a confrontation, but an opportunity for you, the viewer, to confront yourself. Um, because you can really only know who you are by understanding your relationship to others. And so I feel like there is this response in responsibility um, that is beautifully created in this film. Um, all the time, allowing everyone in the film to assert their extraordinary agency. And in the absence of a total lack of response from the judicial system, this artist and all of these artists here together seized the visual field as a way to respond. I, um, I think that maybe, Jensi, when we, when we moved to Denmark, or you moved to Denmark and came and worked with us, I think what, what we could contribute and what you sometimes can contribute when you are a co-producer from another culture is that you can ask a lot of questions. And you come from a point where it's okay to say, I don't understand anything. And when Jensi first told me about uh, everything that happened to uh, his brother, I, I really didn't understand. I didn't understand this uh, legal system. I didn't understand how there could be something like a grand jury like this. I didn't understand how this could not be seen as a crime. I really, really didn't understand. And I think that that was maybe what, what we could contribute, all these questions from the outside. Any other thoughts or comments from the team about the, about the process? We have, we, we are, we are down to the last question. Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, go ahead, Nancy. Is there any chance that the case can be reopened? And any chance the case can be reopened? I know from my research that there's no chance um, the, for the case to be reopened. And honestly, the film isn't about that. It, it's not about finding him or finding anyone to, um, to hold accountable. It's so far beyond interested, being not interested in that at all. But the answer legally is no. I want to thank this incredible team, and I want to thank Yancy for it, for this film. Thank you all for coming. Well, thank you so much, everybody.